Mr. Lake A. Alder is the founder and principal of Alder Consulting, Nigeria's leading creative intelligence firm with offices in both Lagos and London. He is credited with introducing branding as a discipline to Nigeria and has consulted on policy, politics, and business at the highest levels, both locally and internationally. He has consulted on policy formulation for the federal government of Nigeria and the federal ministries of information and communication, education, foreign affairs, and solid minerals development, among others. He is the author of several books and was the host of a weekly radio business program, Minding Your Business with Lake A. Alder on 92.3 Inspiration FM in Lagos, Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Great Leadership Conference, Mr. Lake A. Alder. Okay. It's going to be a blessed time. Uh, Pastor Tola, I want to thank you once more for inviting me to speak. Uh, you've elevated me to the position of pastor. You know, I don't feel I like qualify to be a pastor, <laughs> you know, but I know it's an argument we're going to keep on having, <laughs> you know, so I'm not going to attend your church <laughs> so that you don't make me pastor. <laughs> okay, let me thank Pastor Kot Paul and Tola Odutola for inviting me once more to speak at this annual seminar. It's an honor to be invited to speak and to share experiences and knowledge. And that's what I'm going to be sharing today. Uh, because the profile of the people that are attending this conference is a bit wide, I'm going to speak at a higher level and at the lower level. And I'm going to address SMEs in particular so that they will know, you know what to do in certain situations. Today, we're going to be looking at structure. We shall also be looking at branding. Now, our topic of deliberation is building structure and restructuring your brand. To be honest, it's hard to accommodate the two within a framework, especially within the amount of time that is allotted to this lecture. You know, you know, if, we, if I talk about branding, we can be here till tomorrow. Uh, but to be honest, it, it's hard to put them together. In management science, um, the two are hardly ever linked. And um, I shall I ever be attempting to the equivalence of a modern miracle by showing the logical linkage between the two. So let's begin. Now, the first thing that you need to note about restructuring or structuring a business is that it is an imperative, whether you run an organization, whether you run a church, whether you run an SME, whether you run a corporate, it's an imperative, it is not optional. Structuring goes to the very heart of the blueprint of the organization. It determines success, codifies failure and regulates growth. Now, simplicity, structuring has to do, and I'm trying to define it now, Structuring has to do with the clear definition of roles within an organization, the integration of the parts into a cohesive whole so that the organization can deal on a set of objectives efficiently. And let me take that again. Structuring simplicity has to do with the clear definition of roles within an organization. So there's clear definition of roles, the integration of the parts into a cohesive whole so that the organization can de deliver on a set of objectives efficiently. So there is a focus, there's a reason why you, restruct, you structure your organization. It's not structuring for the sake of structuring, it's so that you can deliver on a set of objectives efficiently. Now that statement, however, assumes what I call unification of the fundamentals. But to help you understand it, think of the Federal Republic of Nigeria or a federal republic. The federating states must have binding fundamentals there must be an agreement on concepts and principles. Without it, they cannot properly federate. Let me illustrate with a bit of my personal history. And, and I want to make, you know, bring in some anecdotal evidence so that we can relate to what I'm, you know, I'm saying. And I, 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 I want to go back into history, my personal history, so that you see what I've been through. Now, in the year 2000, that's 22 years ago, I felt terribly ill. All the consulting was younger at this time, and the staffing was even younger. The company was, as the Bible will say, incoate. Now, I had, I had a minor surgery and an appendectomy. We did go well. Um, I was scheduled to leave the hospital within the week, but then there are not, another element came calling. Ailment came calling. Diseases often do that. Um, a lesser disease often serves as John the Baptist to a more virulent disease heralding the dawn of a new regime of sickness. So that was the situation I was in. The only problem was we were now dealing with a ghost disease. The doctors and specialists couldn't define it. They couldn't agree among themselves. They battled over my diagnosis, despite the copious amount of blood drawn for tests and analysis. Those doctors drew more blood from me than their ruler. 
Um, I will end up spending about three months in that hospital. And uh, I was so ill, I sent an instruction to my lawyer to prepare my will. Now in search of therapeutic amelioration, I packed a bag and decided to travel the world. I needed to rest my soul. I traveled to London and then from London, I flew to Rome. I recall vividly that my hotel in Rome was on the street where the police department located, you know, that dedicated to the mafia was located. Uh, but I didn't meet any godfather, you know, so uh, I went to the Vatican and I didn't meet the Pope either. While I was in Rome, my best friend called me from Spain. He's a medical doctor and was vacationing in Spain. I flew to Alicante, spent a few days with him. Then from Alicante, I flew to Bilbao to appreciate the, the constructivist architectural masterpiece by Frank Gehry, the Guggenheim Museum, Museum in Bilbao. From there, I left for Barcelona. Then I flew to Athens, moved to Venice, freighted myself to Milan. I don't know how I did it, but I somehow found myself at the beach hotel in Accra, Ghana. I found the waves of the sea very soothing, especially at night. From there, I flew to Senegal. I used Senegal as a launch pad to Cape Verde, and in Cape Verde, I felt terribly ill again and flew straight to Lagos. And from Lagos Airport, I drove straight into the hospital. I was so ill, I never thought I would return to the company, you know, to all the consulting. I didn't work for an entire year, I just couldn't. Now, I didn't tell you all these things because I want to show you that I'm, you know, uh, Gulliver's Travels so or Journey Just Come. Um, here is a miracle, and that's where I'm, 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 I'm leading you to. The point I'm trying to make is that all that consulting survived despite my absence. I spent a year out of the company, but the company survived despite my absence. And mind you, the people that were running the company were very, very young. They were in their 20s. I think the oldest ones have been 25 or 26. The company survived for six reasons. And I want you to note this down. Um, I will make the lecture available to you. So pay attention to what I'm saying, you know, but listen to what I'm saying very well so that you can learn from it. Number one, I wasn't the sole signatory to the account. There were two or three other signatories to the account, number one. Number two, we worked out a collegial system for handling briefs. Not one person can handle a brief. So many people handle a brief. So many people bring their perspectives you know, to a brief. Number three, I was not the sole face of the organization. Number four, the enterprise wasn't domiciled in me. There are many entrepreneurs that the enterprise is domiciled in them. Number five, everyone's role and function was well-defined. Number six, and the last one, the company had a defined set of values and a corporate philosophy that we all subscribe to, the ethos of the firm. Now, without a proper structure, the organization couldn't have survived. There was, of course, the grace of God, but we consultants don't talk about God. We focus on reason and logic. Grace is illogical, so we don't talk about it. Now, from the story I just told you, we can take out a number of lessons. There's a mindset configuration those, those who lead organizations ought to have. There's, they, you have to have this configuration for your mindset. It doesn't matter if the organization is a business, a church, or an NGO, you must be mindful of the following. And I'm going to list those following things, okay? Number one, there is something called key man risk in business or in the church or in an organization. The scriptural principle relating to this is strike the shepherd and scatter the sheep. There's key man risk if without you, the system cannot survive and the organization will go down if you're not there. You must work towards eliminating key man risk. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have your role to play as a founder of the organization or as the most talented person in the organization. It's just that if we eliminate you, the company can still go. They may not function in your office, or in your, in, your, in, your, in your capacity, but the company can still function. Key man risk is particularly prevalent in African organizations. Hardly do you have businesses that survive the demise of the founder. If you want your organization to survive, you don't be the alpha and the omega. I mean, that title is, you know, is reserved for God. Don't be the great I am, just be the great I'm not. Therefore, when you are structuring an organization, have a future for the future, have a future that there's a possibility that you may not be there and the company has to survive or the organization has to survive. Number two, second lesson. A leader must not be a bottleneck in his own organization. You're a bottleneck if nothing can be done without your approval, 
if you have to sign off on everything, vet everything. Since the efficiency of a system is determined by the inefficiencies of bottlenecks within an organization, now that sounds like big grammar, let me break it down. In any organization, there are what you call bottlenecks. A necessary bottleneck is accounting. The accountant just doesn't sign off on everything. He examines things and then, you know, um, there's an invoice methodology, there's an approval methodology. So that's a necessary bottleneck. There are what you call unnecessary bottlenecks and you find that in the civil service, especially in Nigeria, where some people have erected toll gates and everything. It's an unnecessary bottleneck. Now the efficiency of the system, the totality of the system is determined by the inefficiency at the bottleneck. So if the organization can do something ordinarily in four days and the bottleneck display the, you know, um, um, delays it by two days, the efficiency of that organization, of your organization, will be determined by the two extra days that has been added because of an unnecessary bottleneck. So necessary bottlenecks include quality control, accounting systems, but if the leader, and you get this a lot, if the leader is an unnecessary bottleneck the organization can only go as fast as it treats issues. So things only go as fast as its in-trade moves or its out-trade moves. A bottleneck, if you think of a bottleneck, just think of Coca-Cola as a bottleneck. The fluid is pouring out at a certain particular rate until it gets to that bottleneck and then it slows down. Therefore, the efficiency of an organization in total is determined by the inefficiencies at the bottleneck. Okay, I hope you got that. If you don't get it, I'll explain during the question and answer, but I think it's pretty easy to get, okay? Uh, the leader, if it's the bottleneck, owns the entire system with the space, was, and, and this is where culture comes in, a terrible culture you will, ima will imagine within such a system. A psychophantic culture develops, there will be spies reporting on everybody in the organization, local leadership will be undermined. Now, you may think that that is far-fetched, but we were consulting for an organization, a bank, and what happened was that the leader was so insecure that at six o'clock, which is a closing time, or at five o'clock, you see a line of people that are, you know, sitting in his conference room, in, in, its, um, in his waiting room. All of them are waiting to give him information on what the head of the pathway did, what this person did, what this person said. Well, without a doubt, the, you know, that, you know, very soon the organization collapsed. So a psychophantic culture develops when you don't take cognizance of structuring. There will be spies reporting on everybody in the organization. Look, that did that will be on the mind. Number three, it is wise to encourage teamwork in your organization. The more silos exist in your organization, the less effective the system is. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story because I really want you to get these things and remember this story. So I'm trying to you know, tell the parables of Jesus and be like Jesus. You know, He was using case studies, business case studies. So I'm using my own case studies to be like Jesus, okay? Now, as a young lawyer, I was saddled with a case of a delinquent loan transaction with one of one of our clients, a bank belonging to the Southwestern states of Nigeria. Now, I needed documentation to build my case. You know, please, I used to be a lawyer, you know, so um, I think I practiced law for one or two years, youth call and one year, and I decided that law was too boring for me. So I used to be a lawyer, okay? I needed documentation to build my case. So I went to the corporate headquarters. The building had four floors. I soon discovered that each floor was dedicated to a tribe. The, you know, each floor was an ethnic conclave, one ethnic group per floor. This is reality I'm telling you. Now the kids occupied one floor, the Jeshas occupied another floor, the Undu another floor, the Oyu another floor. Each floor was manned by a general manager who refused to employ from outside his ethnicity. The loan documents were lost in the labyrinth of organizational ignorance and ethnic short-sightedness. The floors refused to work together. Why? Because they were, you know, were like Nigeria, you know, it's just that they were all concentrated in southwestern Nigeria. I had to go to the court archives, lock myself in there to build a case on the filings of the defendant. Teamwork matters. Eliminate silos in your organization. There are those that are always trying to show that they are the stars. You need to get them to align. You know, their, your name is not Ronaldo. Even Ronaldo relies on teamwork. So teamwork matters. Number four you have to develop a management system. Leadership is not the same as management. This is something that confuses a lot of people. Management does not rely on aura or persuasive skills. In fact, a good manager may be absolutely boring, but he or she understands the system 
abides by the system, follows procedure, is regulated by the system. Is latitude or latitude is within the ambit of the system. The regulatory protocol of a system can be as simple as no letter goes out without the secondary signatory. It can be as simple as that. The instruction, as basic as it is, is at the heart of an ethics case that is threatening to drown the reputation of a leading law firm in Nigeria now. Management is about proper function, risk management, and efficiency. It is not about aspiration. It's not about inspiration. How do we make this work in a predictable and consistent manner is the essence of management. Let me repeat that. How do we make this work in a predictable and consistent manner is the essence of management. You don't need to know anybody. The system is working. That's what management is all about. Number five, clearly define the spiritual dimensions of your organization. What do I mean by spiritual dimensions? I mean vision, mission, values, culture, philosophy, or ideology of the organization. Successful countries have what you call spiritual dimensions. You know, um, they deal with conceptual, they have a conceptual focus. On successful countries don't have any conceptual focus, but successful companies also tend to deal with the, 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 the spiritual dimensions are well-defined. So your values must be well-defined, your culture must be spelled out, your philosophy and ideology must be spelled out, the mission must be spelled out, the vision must be set out. In consulting circles, by the way, values are known as quote and unquote soft issues. But history shows that they are not soft issues at all, but that they are very hard issues that are wearing velvet gloves. If you violate ethical values, for instance, your organization may be at risk. If you doubt, read a few corporate obituaries like Enron and Arthur Anderson. They didn't go down because of lack of strategy. They were killed by so-called soft issues, not want of strategy. These were brain, brain boxes who see when and why the values were bad. The values were poorly executed. The values were not well-defined and the organization collapsed. And I have so many case studies like that. I've seen a bank go down in exactly one week, one week because of proper, because of lack of values. Number six, build your brand into a factor of production. Build your brand into a factor of production. This is a linkage to branding. The factors of production in classical economics are land, labor, enterprise, and capital. I don't know if you still remember your economics 101. Proper branding will draw attention to the products of your organization. You'll be less reliant on human intervention or propagation. I recall a particular year at Alder Consulting, we had employed seven new associates, fresh graduates. We asked them to open a salary account, and all of them, without exception, chose a particular bank. They were not marketed by the bank. They just threw to the bank. That's what good brand, that's what good branding does. Good branding reduces the cost of marketing. It works as a factor of production. So while the other banks were selling marketing officers out to get people, this people, the cost was transferred back to the customer who went to the bank themselves to open this bank account. So I want to look at something now. One, uh, I want to look at something. I want to look at what you call the imperatives of leadership. Okay, now this, there are four imperatives of leadership. And again, by the time we start getting to the end, I'll give you another anecdotal evidence. Let me share with you the imperatives of leadership. These are the things a good leader should be mindful of. Number one, biodegradability. I repeat that, biodegradability. A good leader recognizes is a biodegradable entity. What does that mean in English? It simply means, that with time, your strength and your energy reduce. So will your emotional capacity, so your strength reduces, your energy reduces, your emotional capacity reduces. It's the reason why last ones are spoiled, but first ones tend to be super disciplined. Jacob called his first one the strength of my youth. It's because he had physical, emotional, and mental strength to bring him up. The same principle applies to running an organization. In your late 50s and 60s and 70s, you are going to become tired emotionally, especially if you work in Nigeria. Uh, you are going to be drained. You fought too many battles. You must want, you just want to rest. You want to coast along and reward yourself. Moses in his younger days was a Fidel Castro. At 40, he was full of revolutionary zeal. That zeal had petered down at the age of 80. The confident revolutionary had become a reluctant nationalist. Mandela at 40 was not Mandela at 80 either. 
is smartly served one term before handing over to the younger generation. You get tired, whether you like it or not. And it can only be easier if you groomed younger leaders and built management. They will pick up your lapses. Therefore, strength is inversely proportional to the arrow of time. Now you can depict that in an equation as X in brackets alpha one over Y, you know, one slash Y. We can also express it as strength equals to K slash arrow of time where K is constant. But the point being made is that as the years go by, your strength reduces. Number two, the imperatives of leadership, generational impetus. A good leader recognizes the generational impetus. What does that mean? Whether you like it or not, a new generation takes over, takes over the critical sectors of the economic and political spaces. These are facts. As time goes on, there are meetings you won't be able to attend as a leader. It is either you are too old for such meetings or your profile is too high. You'll be age inappropriate. And there'll be meetings you can't go without a younger executive in tow. I remember a meeting we convened at Asorok Villa in Nigeria. Asorok Villa is the White House of Nigeria. And we were handling the Brand Nigeria project and then um, we convened the meeting at, at the villa. Now, um, seated around the table were a generational breed of bank executives. We had invited bank CEOs, you know. Um, they were mostly in their 40s, you know, early 40s, middle 40s. But there was an age inappropriate executive at that meeting. He was in his early 70s and he was the, bank, he was the chairman of his bank. He insisted on attending the meeting. And everyone wondered why he came. It was just like a fish, you know, it was, it just stood out. Um, it was too old for the language being used at the meeting, the ideas being shared, the issues being discussed. The people seated around the table were junior officers when he was CEO. It was too old for the participants around the table. It gets worse if you're a legend in your field. There are meetings legends don't go, they send their representatives. So let me go to the third imperative of leadership now. Remember there are four. The first one I told you was, um, let me go back so that you can see it, biodegradability. The second one is generational impetus. The third one is spiritual totemism. A good leader over time becomes a spiritual totem of his organization. I repeat, a good leader over time becomes a spiritual totem of the organization. And I'm not talking about praying you know, in tongues or any of those things here. That's not the way we consultants use spiritual. We use spiritual for the intangible, the things that the guiding philosophy, the things that we can't hold, but which generate, which coordinate the organization and control the organization. Now there are four or five stages in the evolution of leadership. And you are going to experience this as time goes on. You, and you, even with right now, you can locate yourself where you are. The first one is the leader as manager of an idea. So you are the one with the idea for the organization. You just started the company. So you are the manager of the idea. You are managing the idea. You are putting together uh, PHR. You are putting together resources and all those things to get the idea going. So that's the first evolution that you have. You are the, you are the leader or manager. I don't care what kind of company it is. I don't care whether it's a $400 billion company or whatever. You start as a manager of an idea. The number two, the leader as a manager of men. Now you brought in the HR people, now you need to manage them so that you know, they adhere to the objectives of the organization and they're able to do their work effectively. Number three, the leader as a manager of systems. Now you put systems in place in the organization and you're managing the systems rather than managing men. Because if you try to manage men as the organization grows, that becomes impossible. I mean, try managing 400 people at the same time, you can't do that. So you manage systems, there's an HR system, there's a technological system, there's strategy, there's all those things. That's what you manage as a leader. Then number four, the leader as a manager of spirituality. And number five, the leader as manager of the political. I'll talk a little bit about this. Let me repeat what my explanation. At the beginning of the enterprise, your role as a leader is the development of the product or idea of the organization. At this stage, you assume many roles. Structure is primitive and relatively small. Indeed, everyone takes on dual roles in the organization. As the business organization develops, however, you must shift, and this is impossible, it's an imperative. You must shift from managing the idea or enterprise to the management of men and women. You develop skill-based leadership. 
This will constitute management or qualify for management in the future. So you concentrate on developing men, management capacity in men. As these leaders emerge and develop, you should begin to concentrate on managing systems. A typical organizational system includes strategy, customer service, product development, brand development. The executives you develop will be fairly competent at what they do. And so what you are looking for is a seamless integration of the structures and processes to deliver on the vision of the organization. I repeat, what you're looking for at this stage is a seamless integration of structures and processes to deliver on the vision. Now with time, you'll emerge as a spiritual totem of the organization. By mean, I don't mean you become prayer warrior or any of such thing. You don't need to be a prayer warrior to succeed in business. There are many prayer, non-prayer warriors to succeed in business. So that's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not against prayer, say that, please. Um, by this time, the spiritual dimensions of an organization, the vision, the mission, the values, and the culture, you become the guardian of those things. You are less involved in day-to-day -day management. You're also taking on a mentoring role as well. Your contribution is more about wisdom rather than strategy. Indeed, many leaders leave the organization at this stage. Remember Jeff Bezos left Amazon, you know, to hop to, to go and do more experimental stuff, something that will challenge him. Um, and, and you see that, you see Bill Gates doing the same thing. You know, he went to manage his foundation. The last stage is your political evolution. That's a height of leadership. Now you manage at this level, very high level contacts. You have a Rolodex of the most important people in the country and beyond. Because of you, six degrees of separation becomes two degrees of separation. So the managers need to contact somebody and it's a high level official or something. And so oh, let's call Mr. Alder, he should know the person. And I call the person and I say, oh, you know, we'd like to do this. He wouldn't talk to any other person because it's me. He will talk to me because I have the profile to engage him. Um, you protect the enterprise politically because in some countries like Nigeria, you may go to bed as a furniture seller and wake up and your business has been banned. So you need to protect your organization politically. This is something that a lot of people don't do. They don't know that they need to protect their organization politically. Once your organization is making insane money or there's undue attention of your organization, you need to protect your organization politically. Golf becomes an option at this stage. You're not really interested in golf. You're just interested in making high level contacts and getting an understanding going. Some leaders as this stage take on charitable work to build equity for the organization. So part of your job is also to build equity for the organization politically. And then you take on mentoring role for the CEO designate because by this time you should have people that are almost qualified to be CEO and you take on mentoring role for, this, for that designate. Now note that sometimes the spiritual and political stages are combined. You know, so it's not necessary that you have to have five stages or six stages. Sometimes some roles are combined. Your duty as a leader is to make yourself redundant with the passage of time. Let me repeat that. Your duty as a leader is to make yourself redundant with the passage of time. It is called self-redundancy. Now in this last segment, this is the last segment of, our, of my paper. Uh, in this last segment, I want to talk to SMEs. If you have to spell everything out to your staff, in total so that they wouldn't make a mistake, chances are that those staff are too junior to you and there's a gap in your organization. Let me repeat that. If you have to spell everything out to your staff in total so that they wouldn't make a mistake, chances are that your staff are too junior to you. You need someone in between you and them. Someone you don't need to spell everything out to. The earliest symptom of this gap is your, in your business is if you find yourself constantly screaming at your staff. I don't know if you've seen people like that. They're always constantly screaming. Their blood pressure is always going up. Their veins are always bulging. You know, their, their arteries, carotid arteries are threatening to burst. It is because they wouldn't just hire somebody to be in between them and the next level. You need an in-betweener. Some entrepreneurs think that they are saving money by not hiring higher grade of staff as in-betweeners. They don't realize it, but they're essentially displaying the missing staff salary as profit. The person you are not paying, the person you, you, don't, you refuse to engage, that you are appropriating a salary as profit. That's not profit. You're just you know, eating up somebody's salary. It is false profit, and they are false profits. In fact, at some point, you're going to pay a heavy price for not hiring the higher grade staff. You need someone to hold the fort 
while you're away, someone who can reasonably deputize for you. You need someone who can interface with clients in lieu of you. Let me illustrate my point with another business experience I had. With this, I'll bring the lecture to a close. Now, before starting all the consulting, I ran a design firm. We designed and produced invitation cards, brochures, stationaries, and the like. One day I got a call from a church and the church was hosting a program One day I wanted branded notebooks as gift items for attendees. But the time frame was too short. So they asked me, can you produce these notebooks under pressure? I considered a lot of things and I said that, yes, I knew I could produce it. So I made a promise that I would. Uh, this time I was working for the Italian embassy, the Brazilian embassy, the, uh, the British embassy, the British uh, uh, mission, uh, whatever, you know. I was working for many you know, organizations like that. So I was pretty confident of my quality. What I needed to was to work on the time for this particular production. So I deduced I could take on the job. So I did the design, got it approved in one day, took the design for the lithographic work, etched the plates, bought board and paper and printed. This was the way we printed in those days. And I employed a laborious system of production because it, that required direct supervision because that was the only way I could guarantee quality and schedule. You can't leave a job to contractors to do. You must monitor your contractors. Your client did not employ these contractors. They are working for you. The client has no business whatsoever with the consult contractors. You are the only person that the client knows. And so stop giving excuses. Oh, it's with the printer. Oh, it's with the tailor. Oh, it's with the this. Don't mind them. They haven't done this for me and everything. The client has no business knowing any of your subcontractors. Anyway. Everything was done except the spiral for these notebooks. But the spirals wouldn't take more than one hour. So we finished printing, we finished collating. All that we needed was a spiral system. So I left instruction with two of my staff to collect the notebooks after the spiraling and take to the client before the program started. So we were well within time. I congratulated myself on pulling off a miracle and went to my church for a music concert. After the concert, I came out of the church auditorium only to find two of my staff, the two staff sitting at the entrance of the church. They had the notebooks in front of them. They said they were waiting for me. According to them, the man doing the spiral binding, binding had taken on another job as soon as I left. They were hungry with him and fought him until they finally, he finally did that job. They were still sitting with righteous indignation and had come to report to me in church. So I asked them, why didn't you take the notebooks to the clients? There was no answer. They didn't think of taking the notebooks to the client because the program, <coughs> I'm sorry. So they didn't think of taking the notebook to the clients because the program will have started. We were supposed to deliver before the program started after all. They had been sitting there in front of that church for over an hour. I was livid. I packed the notebooks and put them in the boot of my car and drove like Jehu from Ikeja to Ikoyi. As I got to Ikoyi and as I was parking my car, the auditorium began vomiting the attendees. I saw the attendees coming out of the auditorium. The program was over. I learned an invaluable lesson that day, that if the gap between you and the next member of staff is too wide, you are going to pay an awful price. Structure at its most basic level is having someone who understands imperatives and can take good decisions to ensure service delivery. I want to thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture and I've simplified it for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I won't call you Pastor Liki. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'll call you again, but thank you, Leke, for this, you know, uh, insightful, you know, delivery uh, as usual. You know, it's always mind boggling and uh, there are a lot of things to unpack in your delivery. And uh, we have quite a thank few you. questions there. Thank you. Uh, you know, um, the first one, actually, I think you've answered it, but... Uh, Maybe for emphasis, uh, let me ask it again. It says, in the configuration of mindsets, you said that don't be a bottleneck. That can you shed some light, you know, on that? You know, don't be a bottleneck. 
thing of this one. It's, 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 it's quite easy, okay? In any factory, in any system, and I'm trying not to complicate this, you know, um, in any factory, in any system, there are what you call bottlenecks. There are places that things have to pass through and it's narrow. So for example, let's assume that you're in a factory and you're producing 10 notebooks at the rate of, uh, the, you are producing at the rate of 100 notebooks per hour. When it gets to the bottleneck, it reduces to about 50 per hour. Why? Because quality control is taking place and things like that, okay? Now, you can use your imagination and see your organization that way. So let's imagine that your organization is, uh, I don't know, you're a construction organization. The bottlenecks may be supply, logistics, um, accounts, uh, all those things. So there are places where there's no, there's no, um, there's no supervision that is so much required. But there are some places that things have to slow down so that quality can come through. And there are some places that have to slow down so that fraud is not committed. Those are typical bottlenecks. Now, the rate of the efficiency of the organization, and this is management science I'm talking about now, the rate of the efficiency of the organization is dependent by the rate of efficiency at the bottleneck. Let, let me explain. If you have a relay race and the first runner runs very fast, but the second runner doesn't run very fast, the eventual outcome of the relay race is going to be dependent on how slow that second runner is. If everybody runs very fast, the system will be fast. But if you have a slow second runner, it will drag everybody back. That is a bottleneck. Everything must pass through it, but it's not fast. So the, in, the efficiency of an organization is determined by the inefficiencies of bottlenecks. And, and let, me, let, me, let, me, let me illustrate what I'm trying to say. I have a mentee, she's in Germany. She's running a factory in Germany. So she calls me one day, you know, and I'm having a mentoring session with her. And she says, look, we search everywhere. I'm managing this factory and everything. And I know that there are problems, but I don't know where the problems are. So I'm in Lagos. I'm consulting for her in Germany. So I said to her that, identify for me the bottlenecks. So she identified the bottlenecks. So I told her, okay, calculate the efficiencies at the bottleneck. Because she's a scientist, so she can, she can flow very well with me. So she calculated the efficiency of the bottleneck. You know what we discovered? The problem was not in the factory. The problem was in cutting goods away from the factory, the logistics outside the factory. So what you need to ask yourself is that, for example, you go for vacation and nothing can be treated in your company except you are back. Everything that is, you know, that, that needs to be done in that organization is delayed by your 30 days. And there'll be missed schedules, there'll be missed opportunities, there'll be contracts you can't define, deliver. That's what you call a bottleneck. You have become an unnecessary bottleneck in the organization. However, assuming that you can break your role down and somebody can take a part, another person can take a part, or you can agree that, okay, let's agree on a collegiate system, then the system moves fast. So the problem many times for many, especially African business, and I don't know where we got this mentality from, is that without me, this business will not run. Without me, this church will not run. I mean, first of all, it's a spiritually ignorant statement to make, you know, uh, because God will show you, you know, that he can run his church without you, okay? And I'm talking, that's my religion, okay? I don't mind all that stuff, okay? But I'm saying that if your organization cannot do anything without you, then you become the problem in your organization. You're a key man risk. Okay, okay. Uh, and those are people we call in church uh, principalities. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> Thanks, thank you so much. Because I mean, I, I, I understand what you are saying. But I also have to bring it down to where I practice, you know, which is the church, you know. So the name that we have for them is that they are principalities, you know. And uh, <laughs> you know, so so uh, there's a way we uh, we know what to do with principalities, you know. So number two, please, number two, you know, considering today's globalization, how can we restructure our businesses or brand to capture international okay. markets? without losing our identity, you know, how can we, yeah. Okay, two, two levels. First of all is the ability to work remotely. Okay. Um, I remember I used to tell pastors to get ready for an era in which marriages would be conducted online. And everybody thought I was joking. I mean, I said these things 10 years ago, 
You know, now people are getting married without being in the same venue. The pastor is in one venue, the bride is in one venue, the, husband, the groom is in another venue. Um, what you need to know is that the globalization is to your advantage because it means you are not being judged on the color of your skin, but the level of your de in delivery and the quality of the values that you have. Um, what scares people is integrity. Can I transfer money to this company and they will work meritoriously without working off with my money? So you need to solve your integrity questions out. Okay, the second thing is that you've got to learn to you know, work remotely. Let, let me give you an example because I eat my own dog food. Um, we had a gubernatorial campaign to handle in Nigeria, but by the time they approached us, it was Christmas. So someone was in America, all the major staff had traveled, the senior staff had traveled. Someone was in America, I think I was in Abu Dhabi, another staff was in Dubai, somebody was in Canada, somebody was all over the world, somebody was in Barbados. And we were able to coordinate a campaign and design campaign materials and all those things. We never met for once, for one month, we were working remotely and we were delivering to the client. That is the essence of globalization because then you don't need to be physically present to get the job done. Mm -hmm. However, before you do that, remember what I said about values and culture. You need to, don't assume that workers are ready-made. Workers are made, they are taught. So you need to make your workers what you want. And the way we do it as older consulting is that our values are important to us. So when you apply to join us, and you passed all the exams and all the interviews and all that or whatnot. On the first day that you report for work, you don't do any work. We lock you up in a room and give you our manual to read. That manual talks about our philosophy, our history, our standards, uh, you know, everything about the company. How it all started, how we spend our money. We are very particular about social responsibility and all those things. Uh, when you read all those things, and you are okay with them and you still want to join us, welcome. However, at that stage, you can still work out. And that is something that people don't do. So if you are going to run a global system, there must be an agreement on a set of values and culture. This is the way we do it at Baltimore. This is the way we do it at Older Consulting. This is the way we do things here. If you don't have that, you are going to have problems. And people think that they can circumvent that or that they can use that to decorate annual reports or to decorate reception. And I've seen that a lot. Look, in 2001, there were 128 banks in Nigeria, maybe more. Today, there are hardly 15 banks, maybe 20 banks in Nigeria. What happened? A lot of those banks collapsed because of lack of definition of values and conceptual definition. And as you know, this is painful. You know, when you work so hard to build a brand, and you see a bank go down in exactly one week is very painful. Mm. And so what I'm saying is that before you globalize and you seek opportunities out there, make sure that your team is functional. Mm. There are those who don't have the discipline to work at home. They must develop this discipline because you must still have your management meeting on Monday or on Friday, if you like. Uh, you must review things, you know, what did we agree on last week? What did we say we were going to do? You review that first. Then after you've done that, then you go to new projects and you discuss everything so that the organization is transparent and, and management, of course, assumes responsibility. So I'm not going to discuss the president with an, with an immature staff. You know, it won't be at that meeting. You know, and it, it's, you have to have discipline to do all that. So the opportunities are there and you should market yourself globally. And by the way, marketing is now cheap. It's as cheap as the cost of an ad on Facebook on Twitter, on Instagram. So it's very, very cheap. And you can do targeted marketing. At some point, as a black person, you got to realize that excellence is not defined by the color of the skin, but by the level of oblendula oblongata that is in your skull. So, and you go out there and you face it. And anyway, they don't even need to know you. All they want is your pedigree and your capacity, and you're going to deliver. So it's an opportunity, but make sure that you put your organization together. You don't want to go out for a job and a member of your staff is going behind the organization to pitch for the same job, especially with other people. And, and let me also say this, Pastor Tola. Um, some people don't want to employ. So when they have a project, they borrow from here, borrow from there, borrow from that, and they are on disclosed principals or in disclosed agents. So what happens is that you go to the organization with five of your staff, so-called staff, and you make a pitch. 
The next week, that organization receives another <laughs> pitch from another company, and one of your staff is showing up. Is that you lost the job because it just means that you don't have steady staff, and people are afraid of that. Now, another thing that I need to say, and it is for someone, when you make a pitch, you have to be determined to beat, so beat the next person that it's not going to be 80% versus 75%, that should be 80% versus 40%, especially in an African context. And it happens in America too. Let me give you an example because I'm, I'm using a lot of anecdotal evidence, you know, from my personal experience. We were invited by a very, 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 very large bank to pitch for a job. There was a long process of qualification for the job. So we put together a presentation. We, knew we needed to put together a very fantastic presentation. So we went on a retreat, you know, and brainstormed on ideas and everything. The bank had developed the new brand, but they wanted to deploy the brand. And the question was, how could they deploy it fast? The foreign consultant said that they need three years to five years to deploy the brand. After a strategy session, you know, at a retreat, we came to the conclusion that we don't need more than six months. So we're talking miracles. <laughs> so they said, okay, how do we do it? So we put together this presentation, you know, and I don't want to say it online, you know, and everything, but we put together this presentation and we scored 80 something percent. The next person scored 40 percent. So there was no doubt whatsoever as to who won. Now I knew members of the board of that bank, but I refused to approach them because I didn't want to get involved in the politics of the organization. And I didn't want to be labeled the voice of uh, one particular director or another director. So we won. So give us the job now while I started. A director said, well, there's this other company that he knows and that the, the company was not invited to participate in the pitch process. And I knew what was going on. If we had scored 80% and another person scored 75%, they would never have given us the job because they'll say 75% is excellence, 80% is excellent, but we know this person. So let's give it to the person that we know, you know? So we went away for another retreat, you know, and we came up with another model because we knew that that director will have leaked a presentation to this competing, competition. Mm -hmm. so, we, so they said, okay, the new competition will be within us as a first place holder and the second place holder will score 40%. And the third place holder who scored, who we don't know. So as we were making the pitch, someone just blotted out and said, please, let's give the job to this older consultant. What are we doing here? Because the level of our presentation was so high that there was no way that they could do mago mago, as we say in Nigeria, or any of those things. They had to give us a job. So I'm saying that particularly for somebody, don't be average. Don't go for just 75%. Go for 80% such that, and you, and you know the best way to build a, beat a large corporation, you don't need to beat the large corporation. You just need to beat the people that are doing the presentation for the large corporation. That's where the competition is. So whoever they send, as long as you can beat them, you're beating the large corporation. I'm saying that to somebody, you know, and um, I, I, think, I think somebody needs to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks so much. I, I heard you while you were making a presentation that um, the, the level between the chief executive uh, or the visionary yes. and uh, the staff should not be yes. that far from each other, that they yes. need someone in between That's to right. be able to disseminate the information. Now, this is a question, and I'm going to ask it from the church perspective. You understand? So now, what do you do as a church executive, when the people next to you are the leaders, but every uh, information passed to them that is meant for the rest of the people they are leading, they hold on to it, they don't pass it down. How do you overcome that structure? Those are, those are the real principalities. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, the Bible says, worship the Lord with your mind, your soul, and everything that you have. When you read the message translation, it says, worship God with your intellect. It means that the people that we put in managerial capacity must be people who are intelligent enough to even understand why they should not hold on to things. 
and they're intelligent enough to understand that you harm the organization by doing what you do, what you are doing. Because you are disconnecting the organization. Like, you know, think of railway, railway cabins. When you pass information as a senior pastor to the next cabin, everything is okay. Then somebody disconnects the next cabin from the other cabin. And what happens? The railway derails or something goes wrong. Now, if you know that that is important in your organization, then you must, you see, punishment must also have reciprocal reward system. So it's either you are punished or you are rewarded. And I will ask you to fight such a culture because it's such a terrible culture because it's going to affect the entire organization. What is going to happen is that you're going to have intellectual constipation at the top and then you're not going to have, you're going to have gonorrhea or something or, you know, kwashoko at the lower part because the people don't understand. And the best way to do that is to regularly call a conclave of the church, of the workers, and brief them on your vision, irrespective of these people, so that everybody knows that there's nothing special about hearing from the pastor, you know, anything, because they are holding up the church. And you must punish that. Because in the corporate sector, nobody will tolerate that. So why will you tolerate that in a church, which I believe is a higher organization than a corporate sector? They have a higher purpose. They have a higher dimension. A corporate, a corporate sector, we're only looking for money. You know, but in this case, you're talking about lives. You're talking about so many things. And somebody decides it's going to be a bottleneck and block everybody from, no, no. That person is working against the very essence of the organization. And such behavior must be called out and must be punished. So it may mean that you come to church and general meeting and you call out such a person that pastor so, so, and so, I told you this and I told you to do this and you didn't do it. I hope this is the last time. Hmm. And it also means that you have to check information flow within the system. Hmm. You, you have to map information flow so that you are sure information is getting down. Because you are going to breed a horrible, horrible, horrible church culture hmm. in which psychophancy and all sorts of nonsense are going to come into place. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be horrible. So don't tolerate it. I won't tolerate it in my organization. Why are you tolerating it in your organization? A church is an organization. It's a biographic, it's a, it's a, bio, it's, it's a biological form. You know, it's, it's, it's an organization. Yeah. It runs on things working slowly, things working together, uh, dopamines firing up neurons and things like that. That's what it's all about. So when somebody constitutes himself to almighty, the person is either removed or the person that means, you know, and I don't care how spiritual you are, it is possible to get better job from an untrained apprentice than from a skilled rebel. That's what Solomon said. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, before we let you go, uh, maybe one or two more questions, you know. Um, let me say one thing. I'm okay. to understand how important the question you ask is. It's a very important question. One of the reasons that we advise the federal government of Nigeria to fight 419, this advanced free fraud, is because it is so violent and so terrible that it has the capacity to tarnish an entire generation of Nigerians. And it's worse than armed robbery. Armed robbery is consigned to a geographical space. Robbers either go and rob a bank in a particular location, but 419 for Nigeria has the entire country. So if our government, I will put less effort on armed robbery and more effort against 419. Now, when you have people that are undermining the system, then you have a major problem as a church because the system that Paul designed is an organic entity. It says some are hands, some are foot, some are uh, eyes, some are nose. Everybody's supposed to provide a function and work together. So when somebody decides that the information flow will flow from the middle of Lagata and stop at the midriff, and then you have a major problem. That one is just not the principality. Somebody wants to destroy the organization because the organization must work. The organization must function. That is the essence of an organization or else the pastor can be a lone evangelist preaching somewhere, but the day that you decide to build a system, an organization, it must be an organization. It's not about one person, it's about all of us. There's no self-glorification, there's no self-emancipation. It has to be a group work. Mm. And I fight such things. Mm. I seriously fight such things. I won't allow it. Mm. Mm. 
I, 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 I thank God I asked the question. And, um, and I thank God for the passion with which you answered you know, the question. Uh, it, 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 it's a major issue. And, and that's the truth. You know, uh, in churches, it's a major. And I know that online right now, there are several pastors you know, and ministers that are listening to this. And you had him right. We had you very sound and clear. You know, uh, we need to deal with it. You know, it's like a cancer. And that's the truth. You know, because when I think of this issue, what comes to my mind is when the Bible talks about the anointing oil that falls upon the head of Aaron down to the body and to the skirts, the anointing oil did not at all lose potency as it was going to the skirt. It was the same power that flowed down. So every organization must ensure that whatever comes from the top should be disseminated to every department and people that they are working with. In other Let me give you another biblical analogy. When you read the story of Joseph, people think of the boy who dreamed and all that. And it's not really about dreams. It, you know, the dream was just a, an instrumentality, an ancient instrumentality of the fulfillment of a purpose. That's just what it was. But you notice something in the story of Joseph. The Bible says that his father sent him to go and give him some information to the, to the brothers and go and find out what is going on. In other words, the father prided himself in receiving information, true and full. So Joseph takes information to them. The, he brings information from them to the father. Now, the Bible says that he got to a place and he was lost. He was asking for where are his brothers. They took an independent decision that was not in line with strategy or in line with agreement and decided to do their own thing. And it took some time before Joseph could locate them. And what happened? What you have there is an information dislocation. Mm. So the information that's supposed to be coming from the management staff was not getting to the chairman of the company, you know, and the vice president, who was Joseph, could not get the information. And when information is dislocated, you have a problem. And so what that led to is that it led to people who were able to, you know, what you call individual sovereignty mm. in consulting. You know, when an individual takes on sovereign status and decides to do what he wants to do. I'm just trying to show you that this thing is much more than, oh, you didn't pass on information and all that. You're talking individual sovereignty in an organization. Mm. And that is always dangerous. And you see what happened in Joseph's case, because information could no longer flow from here to there. So he asked, where are my brothers? He said, oh, we saw them going somewhere. And it took effort, resources, before Joseph could locate them. And then, of course, they dislocated the guy, said, you know, and everything. They were planning to kill him. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that something that we think as just non-flow of inflammation is something that is so virulent. Mm -hmm. It's so virulent that it will affect the culture and the values of the organization. And then you have a real problem. So fight it with all you got. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, maybe we'll take this as the last one. What must leaders do in creating a brand that engages and influences multiple generations? You know, we talk of the baby boomers, millennials, the Gen Zs, and all that. How do you, you know, set up a brand that is able to influence all those generations? Or maybe it's not even possible. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's a huge question that requires another seminar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay, so let me let me explain something. Okay. There's what you call psychographic traits. Mm. Okay, so if I want to sell things to you, Pastor Tola, I look at you, you are wearing most likely Versace glasses, sunglasses. Um, I look at you, your beard is um, uh, uh, maybe. Uh, what other brand? Prada. Mm -hmm. You know, your shirt is, you know, I'm, I've located all your brands, okay? And I say, okay, let me sell my product to you, okay? Mm -hmm. so I, the typical thing is to dimension people numerically and say, okay, quantitatively and say, okay, Pastor Tola probably hands $10,000 a day, you know, so based on that, we can sell this particular product to Pastor Tola, okay? But that's not why branding works. Branding works on the psychographic traits of people. So there are people who don't earn as much as Pastor Tola who will buy these expensive things because that's their psychographic trait. They don't have the money. 
And you have that case in America where the people that are buying the most expensive things, the Air Jordans and all those things, are those who can't afford it. And the people who can afford it are buying cheap wristwatches and things like that. So you are not going to sell based only on quantitative parameters. You're only also going to sell based on psychographic traits. How does this person see life? How does this person think? Where does it go? What will motivate him to buy things? You are looking for all those things. So what you do is that you develop what you call a typology. You take Pastor Tola as a typical example of the consumer that you are chasing, and then you map him and say, okay, on Monday he does this, on Tuesday he does this, on Wednesday he does this, at the end of the month he collects his salary, so we're going to target the end of the month, we're going to you know, profile this product in a way that makes him feel that he needs the product, you know, and therefore he's going to buy. So you need to be able to do that. Then another thing, and I don't want to get into this today, you know, you have to do what you call the conceptual definition of your brand. What is the concept of your brand? Think of Body Shop. The concept of the brand is very, very clear. Think of Amazon. The concept of the brand is very clear. You know, all the successful brands are built on concepts. So what is the concept of your brand? You know, sometimes your cause, what do you believe in? What, all those things are what informs the brand. Yeah. Um, for example, in all the consulting, we don't look at certificates. Why? Because even I, my certificate is relevant to the organization. Mm. So we are looking for brilliant young men and women. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what you studied. If you studied mathematics or any of those funny courses that people say are not relevant, you are the one we are looking for. Because we're able to dem domesticate the discipline that you studied to use to solve a client's problem. Mm. Uh, the bank that I told you about, it was a London Underground Railway model that we used to solve the problem. That's what caught the pro the um, the production from three years to four, five years to six months. We studied on the underground railway system. So that's what you are looking at. So study the psychographic traits of the, of, the, of the brand. That tells you what the people can afford, what they are really looking for, because most of the time we're trying to sell what people don't want. We're trying to sell them what the reason they don't want to buy something. So for example, you think you are going to sell a Mercedes and say, because it lasts longer. Who told you that people want to buy, oh, take Coca-Cola. They say Pepsi is sweeter, mm -hmm. you know? But who told you that people buy Coke or a cola drink because it's sweet, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to ask such questions and get into the head of the consumer. If I were to get into this, I mean, you, I, I <laughs> as a 20 something year old, I consulted for a company, big company, zero sales and they had advertising agencies working them, two major advertising agencies working for them. So um, they had seen something that I did and I walked into the company and they said, what can you do? You know, and I didn't, all this, all that consulting had not started by this time. And I listened to them and I realized what their problem was. So I did them a paper that explains this generation, what moves them, what they drive, what they like. And the difference was just, not selling the phone because this company was selling mobile phones. The difference was that I didn't want to sell the phones to them as a utility. I wanted to sell the phones to them as a status symbol because I had examined their psychographic traits and I realized that that's what is important to them. And within six months, that company moved from, you're talking something like, um, I was 20 something, they're talking something like 30 something years ago. This is what I'm relating now. That company moved from zero to a hundred million naira in sales in six months. Put that in perspective, a Mercedes, brand new Mercedes was 70,000 naira mm. then. And I remember they paid me a consultancy fee for that year, about 1 million. Mm. And the next year they promised another 1 million and plus more commissions and all those things. All because I was able to get into the head of the buyer. Sometimes we are designing products and designing ideas around what we want not what the consumer wants. Mm. And so you want to sell to millennials, how do millennials think? Where do they go? That already tells you where to advertise. Mm. What language do they use? That already tells you the tone of advertisement and what words you should use. You want to sell to people like me? What do we, at this age, what are we looking for? Mm. Why should we buy something? And then you, so it's targeted advertising that you do. And if your product is not relevant in my life, forget it, you're not going to build any brand in my life. Because a brand makes people pay habitual obedience to a set of stimuli. Mm. That is why Omo, Blue Omo, is still new 40 <laughs> years after. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. The last part of your 
you know, delivery. I, I, I know that my team for this uh, GLC conference, they are listening to you. I know they are listening to you because this is, these are the things we talk about. How do we project, you know, this conference? How do we advertise? And this is the answer that you've given, you know? So there's no shortcut to it. We just have to do what it takes and then we'll get to where we want to get to. Once again, on behalf of the entire team here, we want to say thank you so much for, you know, uh, accepting to speak and being a blessing, you know, to us. Uh, my regards to your family and uh, thank you once again. Thank you.